Welcome to Wandering Grey Bruce. I'm your host, Krista McKee. Today, we are with the Big Canoe Project. And you might think when I say Big Canoe, you might think of the Chichiman. Well, it is kind of, but it is a big canoe. So welcome, Tom. He is the gentleman that has been the brainchild of the Big Canoe Project. So I'm thrilled to be here on the water. Even though we're kind of dressed a little warm, the water is, is actually warm. And Tom has met us here. We're in the Meaford Harbor, and we are going to go on on an excursion on the Big Canoe. So how did the Big Canoe Project get started? It started when I realized how much time I was spending by myself paddling <laughs> in Meaford. Okay. And, and I also, on every time I go out, I realize, you know, it doesn't take long when you're on the water and you can be on the water for 10 minutes and immediately you feel the benefits of, you know, the stress melts away. You're looking at your own town a completely different way. And I realized the more I did that, the more I wanted to share it with people. Right. And I was at a point in my career where I was looking at, you know, how can I, how can I best play to my strengths? And I kept on going back to an experience I had in 2010 where I joined the David Thompson Brigade, which is now known as uh, Canadian Voyageur Brigades, uh, and did a trip in a big canoe just like this one right. um, from Sault Ste. Marie to the Ottawa River. Wow. How, now, how long did that take? We were on the, we were on the water for three weeks. But, oh, my gosh. And... And we, we could have done the trip much faster, but because of uh, the Canadian Voyager Brigades and, and their, their not-for-profit mandate, um, every community that we go into, there'd be community events planned where we can do educational stuff, teaching mostly about David Thompson himself and his wife, Charlotte Small, who are, uh, they're responsible for mapping most of, most of Canada, like all their early maps up and, and they were used for almost 150 years. And this, uh, the, those two traveled together as a family with their kids uh, greater distances than many of the explorers that we celebrate in, in, uh, in the history books. And so um, telling that story, telling the, the, the story of the, his Métis wife, Charlotte Small, was something we did in, in every community. And then also being invited to the French River powwow. So, so stopping and, and doing things like that uh, really made an impression on me on not only the big canoe as a mode of transportation and, and a mode of transportation that lots of people can get into. You can have up to 12 people. We can fit 14 in this one. Wow. Um, and, and, but be able to move it easily and move it well and comfortably and safely with as few as five. Uh, but also not only provide access, but provide a space where um, people can, can talk about the issues that are that are surrounding them. So when you're on the water, you can't help but talk about the water. And it ends up being a community building exercise where, you know, when you're paddling down the river, if I paddle down the river in my little canoe, nobody's gonna look twice at me. When you paddle down the river in the big canoe, people are gonna wanna get in, people are gonna wanna talk to you. And so it's that whole aspect of the, of the big canoe too that really appealed to me. And, and I knew it, it would be a good vessel, as in, you know, a vessel that, that you go into, but also a vessel as a container of, of possibility. And, and the, it being a container for for good good works in the community definitely definitely good works well even just standing here the the very slow sound of the water hitting the shore is it, it's very relaxing um but this big canoe is how long 29 feet 29 feet so being a person that's not really a water person um what's it made out of it's made <laughs> are we out, gonna float <laughs> it's made out of kevlar it's made out of Kevlar, Kevlar so yeah. And so because of that, uh, they also make a fiberglass model and the fiberglass model is the one I paddled in, in 2010. Uh, the Kevlar is quite a bit lighter and so it means it gets up, gets up to speed much easier. When you do have to lift it up onto the beach, it's much easier to be able to do that. For me, it's all about access, like how, how can I make the most amount of impact with and to the most amount of people and part of that was the choice of the canoe how many people can i fit in the canoe right, and yeah. and and how easy is it to trailer it to say nish nigming or you know the fishing islands or owen sound or and right. so to get it to the people who are who generally uh don't get a chance they don't to, have access to it yeah. exactly yeah. so you mentioned trailering so you this was a special order You've ordered this from where? Like, because you just don't see, yeah. uh, was it 29? 29 foot canoe. 29 foot canoe. You don't see that in a normal sports outfitter spot. Mm -hmm. So 
where did it come from? I, I was I was prepared to drive out to BC oh where gosh. they're where they're made <laughs> because I'm I was after seeing how the the boat performed in 2010 and like the oldest person in, in the in the boat for that whole duration of the trip was 86 years old and he was told by his doctor because of his shoulder issues that he shouldn't be going on the trip and yet the canoe was such and the the teamwork was such that he not only did the trip but like enjoyed every minute of it and thrived off of it wow. so so seeing that and seeing the, the seaworthiness of, of this particular model convinced me that, well, it made me a bit stubborn about wanting this particular boat because I've, I've, I've been in a lot of big canoes right. and, and not, not a lot of them, uh, not, not all of them inspire the same level of confidence. And so when this one came up for sale uh, in White Squall, from White Squall Paddling Center in Perry Sound oh, at the beginning yeah. of the pandemic, okay. I jumped on it. You jumped I on jumped it. I jumped on it, yeah. Gosh, now I'm not gonna ask you how much it was because that's, <laughs> that's your thing, but made out of Kevlar, um, to me that's very impressive because um, I know the canoe my parents used to have was made out of fiberglass and it had a lot of patches on it. This will be indestructible if it's Kevlar? It's, it's, uh, it's not indestructible, but like fiberglass and, and for that, for that um, on that same note, like birch bark, it's easily repairable. So Kevlar is a type of cloth and it's as easy as laying down another layer of Kevlar and, and uh, just... painting over it with epoxy glue. Wow, yeah. wow, this is amazing. So we've actually brought with us um, a few people from Rogers. Um, this would be an excellent way to do um, team building, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like this could be um, quite an adventure for quite a few businesses to do do team building, bonding, what, whatever issues that they might be trying to, um, to develop within their, within their industry, right? Yeah. Um, so you can fit a maximum of how many A maximum people? of 14, I feel more comfortable with 12. With there's, 12? There's seven seats in the boat, okay. uh, not including the little saddle that I set in in the back and five of those seats you can comfortably double up okay double up people on yeah and so in terms of, of team building that's something we, we very much look forward to oh. uh in the in the future because i i do that, see that potential like as soon as you get in the big canoe and you and you feel you're all working together it's it it's almost uh you don't have to you don't have to say as much about working together because you the 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 learning is in the doing is in the doing and yeah. and, and you can immediately feel when people aren't paddling together. <laughs> oh, oops. Yeah. I guess we'll, fight, we'll figure that out as we uh, work our way oh, through. We're, we're doing great today already. <laughs> we're yeah. doing great. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. We just cued the Nature. geese. We just cued the geese. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. We've got uh, quite a few of them flying over. <laughs> That's fabulous. You do quite a few different excursions with, with this boat. Um, so you've got transit, you've got a trailer for it to be on, um, which would be really quite unique. I'd like to see that trailer, but um, <laughs> it, it'll be 30 feet long, 40 feet yeah, long, the yeah, trailer. It, it's quite a long trailer, but at the same time, the boat is light enough. The trailer is fairly light, so it's not too bad to tow. Yeah. And so we, we take bookings on Lake Eugenia in okay. Owen Sound, uh, in Collingwood and in Meaford. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And Lake Eugenia would be very interesting because um, I did an interview in the spring with David Turner and the amount of birds that stop in their migration um, trail stop at Lake Eugenia. And that would be a fabulous place to be out on the boat. It, it's a neat spot. And because it, the boat really is so would. quiet, like you were talking about how that everything seems to be like, you, you slow down when you get to the beach, you slow down when you get in nature. I, I look at Big Canoe as, you know, the if you remember the slow travel movement from a few years, few years ago, they were talking about slow food and slow travel. So right. so you're going slow enough and it's quiet enough that you actually have a chance to, to see what's going on around you. And so, like you said about birds in Lake Eugenia, like this summer we've been seeing egrets and green herons, which oh. I, up until two years ago I had never seen before in my never. life, and ospreys and bald eagles, and yeah, yeah it, it, it's impressive up it there. It would be very impressive, and, and you can put 12 people in the boat. So, um, how can people get in touch with you um, if they wanted to get in on um, a boat tour of Lake Eugenia or, or even in Own Sound? The easiest way is to check out our website, bigcanoeproject.com. Org, org, O R G, okay. yeah, and you can book right through the website, and otherwise you can you can send us an email at info at bigcanoeproject.org or call us. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah, that would be, yeah, I'm 
I would love to do Lake Eugenia, but today we're in Meaford. Yeah. And um, Tom is going to take us on uh, a view of Meaford from the water side. So I'm very excited about seeing Meaford from a side I've never seen before because I've never taken the time shame on me but I've never taken the time to be on water and in our pre-discussion um, before we started the interview Tom mentioned um, that there are so many water trails and then you mentioned um, the littles that were um, in the canoe that pretty much mapped out um, the northern Ontario area from the Sioux to Ottawa River that you took so there there's just so many other um, adventures out there that mm -hmm. we don't really stop and think about that you know we're, we're so trail conscientious here in Gray and Bruce that I'm um, doing it from the waterside I'm I'm thrilled I'm yeah. yeah it's something that I've never seen before and, it, and it's definitely something that I've been thinking about like explicitly and consciously as I see especially during COVID but it was happening before that the the, the how, how how crowded some of the Bruce Trail access has become exactly. in the conservation areas. Yeah. And I look at that in, in terms of, it's great that people are coming up here. It's absolutely wonderful, but we need to be thinking about uh, how are the access in these places? Is the infrastructure in place? And are there release valves? So I uh, release valves for other other places they can they can go in the area that sort of spread out the impact. And I look at I look at the big canoe project as as that opportunity. Huge so low impact. Get people out. Yeah. Get people out. But also, like you said, like if if people haven't been in a canoe and. 10 years let alone like 20 years like this is this is the way to get back in the canoe yeah. and it sort of levels the playing field in terms of if you have a family and this is most of our bookings this summer we're three generations of a family oh, so you'll have the grandparents cool. aunts and uncles like brothers and sisters all the cousins all in the big canoe together and there's nobody who's at the back of the trail of boats who nobody who's flying way off ahead we're all in it together we're all paddling at the same time we're all getting there at the same speed and it's social the whole way there and the whole way back and the whole way back and in terms of whether we have special guest speakers in the boat or if or if uh, one of the guides or myself is is saying our piece we have a captive audience yeah to make an impact and, and, and to connect that that impact with with actions like the water testing that we do and the and the citizen science initiatives that we do which is a huge impact a lot of people are now um, assisting with citizen science and looking at climate change and all that mm. all that stuff that we're starting to realize it's taken us a long time but yeah and yeah. you're definitely on it so tom is going to um get us suited up and teach us a little bit of the do's and don'ts and talk about the paddles that he has which is different one thing i'm really um glad he's the guy that's going to be steering this so stay tuned and we will be in the big canoe <laughs> My uncle Cheney was one of over 150,000 Indigenous children that were taken to residential schools between the 1800s and 1996. My uncle ran away from school wanting to get home to his mom and dad, and sadly he didn't make it and died of exposure. When Gord Downey found out about my late uncle Cheney's story, he wrote Secret Path, a series of poems that became an album, then a graphic novel, a documentary, and a concert. Gord met my family and together we formed the Gord Downey and Cheney Winjack Fund. Together we are sharing Secret Path and other reconciliation resources with legacy schools, setting up legacy spaces across Canada, and hosting events like Secret Path Week to inspire all Canadians to engage in reconciliation. action. Before he left us, Gord asked us all to do something. You're gonna figure it out. Will you join us? Together we can make Canada a better place. Hi, I'm Gavin Bryant, centerman with the Owen Sound Attack. Catch great OHL action on Rogers TV as we bring you Owen Sound Attack games live, both home and away. Hello everyone, your host Antoine Lahashem here on the couch and welcome to season eight. Yay! Eight seasons. And we've got a lot of awesome guests coming up, so keep watching. So we get our life jackets on. Yep. So it's up and over. Yeah, up and over. And then a zip and a clip. And all the, we have whistles and all the life jackets because that's a Coast Guard requirement. As far as the paddles, uh, 
whether we're taking kids out or we're taking adults out, all the paddles are the same size and they're short and they're sweet because uh, when you're sitting close to the water, uh, the less you have to lift the paddle out of the water to the do better. the stroke, the better. So it's, it's all about ergonomics. Uh, you'll also notice that they're bent, just like many of the stand-up paddle boards you're seeing these days, or stand-up paddle board paddles you're seeing these days, and they're bent uh, in order to maximize the amount of power you can get out of your stroke. So you can reach that much further forward, and as you bring it back, it stays vertical for a little bit longer, because as soon as it goes past there, all you're doing is pulling the canoe down into the water. And we're going for as much forward momentum as possible. And so most of the stroke is happening between your catch and your hip. The way to remember which way the bend is supposed to go is there's a little owl and it faces the back of the canoe. Okay. And so you're always reaching forward. Yeah. Wonderful. We're ready to get in the boat. We've had our little tutorial and now let's see if we were all paying attention and we can row this baby. All right. right? And remember, you can, you can squish all the way over to the side you're paddling on. People also don't think of Meaford as a paddling destination. And yet, year over year, I see exponentially more paddlers. Right? Stand-up paddle boards have helped a lot. People are, are that much more willing to, and able to throw a, throw a board on the water and, and get out. And I, I just feel like the more people who are paddle out here, the more people pay attention to what's happening to the bay and, and taking care of it and cleaning it up. And, but you're only gonna really pay attention if it's, if it's immediate, if it's like right in front of you and you can get out and, and appreciate it. And so I feel like the more people who get out and appreciate it, the better things will be. <laughs> That's maybe a naive way of thinking. So is there a trail system along, um, a hiking trail system along the shoreline? Because like I can see um, up here, I can see it looks like a bridge or maybe, maybe not. Um, but there is a, a trail system along the, the water, the, the Big Head River, right? That comes into the Meaford Harbor. We're spoiled in the sense that we have lots of beaches and somehow we've managed to, the town has managed to hang on to those beaches as well as some like soon to be developed no man's land kind of spots like we like we just passed right um but in terms of trails uh along the waterfront there there isn't there isn't as there isn't so much like hiking trails or anything like that the the best the best we have in terms of views of the bay from a hiking trail in meaford is if you go down the georgian trail and you'll get to a a little turning where if you go a quarter of a kilometer down to the water's edge, you come out at the top of the clay banks. Oh, right, yeah. yes. Um, I believe Gray County put in a trail system and a viewing deck on top of the clay banks, but you can't physically yeah. get down to the shoreline. Yeah. Just there's... past what used to be Ormsby's um, Garden Center out That's on Highway right. 26. Yeah. Yeah. The clay banks is a, is a great spot uh, that we're spoiled to have access to in, in Meaford just five minutes away from uh, Memorial Park, like a five minute paddle around from Memorial Park, there's a water access only strip of beaches between Meaford and Christie Beach that is absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, we're, we're very careful about <clears throat> taking people there and making sure that we're leaving the space better than we found it. And the birds and the, the fish over there are absolutely amazing. We often see uh, there's a, there's been a, a mature and an immature bald eagle hanging out there wow, this summer. Wow, nice. Um, last year was the first time I'd ever seen a green heron, and it was the, the first one that I saw was at the clay banks. Um, it's not uncommon to see a whole raft of mergansers, like about 20 to 30 mergansers over and that, there. And that seems strange that you're seeing that many um, waterfowl or water bird species there because there's no nesting spot, right? It's it's strictly clay, so I'm. It's a huge erosion problem, the clay banks. Yeah. Like really, but to have that many species there is very interesting. But I don't know if any of the, any of it is as carbon biosphere conservancy or gray soluble conservation authority lands. But nope. thinking about what's between us and the highway. Yeah. Other than the few buildings you see, like almonds or Ormsby's or gray heron gardens now. Um, what we're, as the crow flies between us and the highway, there's really just the Georgian Trail and then the highway. And the highway. And 
and judging from the distance from the Georgian Trail to that viewing platform we were talking about earlier, yes, like it's there's a good quarter kilometer like buffer of, uh, of of green space, and so when you're on the clay banks, you uh, on the beach at the bottom of the clay banks, you you feel like, and you get the same you get the same impression from uh, going on the Trout Hollow Trail. Yes, but as soon as you're as soon as you're there, you feel like you've gone you know, kilometers and kilometers as opposed to just a couple of minutes. When I look at the clay banks, um, to me it's Mother Nature's way of not allowing development, yeah. really, because yeah. of the erosion factor. The setback from the top of those clay banks would probably be 60, 100 meters. I, I'm not sure, I'm just guessing. But um, because they're not stable, right, it, uh, it is Mother Nature's way of no development. Leaves it in its natural state. We've got a lot of blowdown, which makes great habitat for, for the green heron and the bald eagle that you talked about. Um, it is signed by the looks of it, no, no trespassing, no hunting, private no property. No trespassing, yep. Which, which is, I'm, I'm happy to see that it's still in its natural state. So because of the, the bay that we're paddling into right now, you can see how shallow it is below us. Yeah. But it's, it's shallow like this, almost all the way across to where the, the cottages start, down Christie Beach Road. And it's shallow way out, so it keeps, if you're paddled over here, it keeps, all the, all the motor boats are a fair ways offshore. Yes. And it means the water warms up quickly, and so the carp will hide out in the shadows underneath the roots and like, Excellent. like especially this, this particular willow tree, you often see carp oh, right beside out it. Out here, yeah. yeah. And definitely a good place for cormoran to hang out as well, to, to uh, look where they're going to dive to for, for food. Uh, usually, like this is where this is where we'll take uh, the tours coming out of Meaford. Uh, depending on the the wind, most days the wind is right for coming in here. You can see how the wind drops as you come into this bay too. Yeah. And uh, we did uh, we teamed up with the Imagination Studio out of Clarksburg this summer and did a kids art arts camp with it. So the oh, wow. Ashley from Imagination Studio was doing the oil painting uh, workshop with the kids. But we paddled out to this beach, set up the easels, and then started painting, and then paddled nice. all our paintings back. What a great experience for the kids. So cool. And it's so quiet when you come out here that their, their attention is focused. And whether it's on the painting or the, the water testing you're doing, like they're, they're all in. Let's, uh, let's pull in here and I'm very curious to see what the temperature of the water is. And while we're taking the temperature, we can, we can also take a couple other readings and record them into our Water Rangers app. Nice thing about this citizen science stuff, and it wasn't necessarily something I anticipated when we started doing it, but it was something I hoped for. But this, this citizen science data is now being accessed by uh, government agencies and academics and NGOs. And so it, it's really a way of of not just collecting data, but also taking action to, to track the effects of, of climate change and to participate in a, in a bigger movement across the Great Lakes to get a better understanding of, of what the, the challenges we're facing are. So take us through what we're going to be doing here for your citizen science project. So this is uh, two of the tests we do with our Water Rangers kit. Water Rangers is also an app that's uh, teamed up with Great Lakes Data Stream. Okay. And so this is what I mean about our data getting to places where it gets used. Um, the test you're holding in your hands right. is a simple uh, test strip that is used for um, spas, so your hot tubs. So it, it tests, uh, gets a reading on pH, on hardness, on uh, chlorine levels, and alkalinity. Ah. And okay. so if you dip that in here. In here, okay. Do I have to leave it in for a certain nope, amount of you time? You pull it right out. Pull it out. And these tests are designed so that uh, we can get the readings instantaneously and we can discuss them. So if you line this up mm -hmm. like this, then you can oh, like see all right, where are we at. Oh, I so see. So on the top, yeah. you can see that we're at zero for chlorine. Right. Uh, we're somewhere in between maybe we're in the on the acidic side of things right yeah and down here the alkaline. for alkalinity 
we're in the 120 range, which is fairly high. Um, and that makes sense for this area, given the, the, the geology. The limestone? The limestone. Right. So limestone is naturally alkaline. I, until I started doing these tests, I thought that pH and alkalinity, <laughs> you've got a, a dragonfly in your hair. All right. <laughs> um, I thought the pH and alkalinity met, were, the, were one and the same, but alkalinity measures the ability for um, the water to withstand a, an, an acid shock. Okay. So if there was to be an acid rain event, alkaline water would come back to come back to, to previous levels quicker than uh, non-alkaline water. And hardness in the bottom, it's given us a... Yeah. The hardness of the water generally sits around the middle in the 200. Right. And that, that also makes sense given how quickly the limestone erodes. So there is lots of, lots of uh, sediment in the water. So the other test that we do, which okay. is nice and fast is our conductivity meter which is what uh conductivity measures the presence of heavy metals and oh wow okay and yeah. a lot of the heavy metals you get into are talking pollution so this right. number on the top yes. is about where it sits all summer long we're generally getting readings of 197 to 210 it'll shift a little bit for a point of comparison uh Industrial wastewater sits about 15,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the water today is in at 17.5 degrees. It I is. wouldn't have figured, well, you know what? Um, <laughs> I have two wet feet and I'm telling you the water's not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good. Definitely climate change in action. Yeah, yeah. Well, great, yeah. thank you. This experience has been absolutely an eye-opener to see the difference between what's happened along the shoreline by man and what it actually looks like in nature's way. Um, the water here is absolutely pristine. My two feet are soaking wet inside my rubber boots. It's a must experience. You have to do this. Tom is an absolute treasure. He is the best guide I've ever had. Um, talking about the different species of birds, his experience, what he's learnt, um, where he goes. Uh, definitely Lake Eugenia is a spot to have Tom be your guide, so check out Tom. So we've just finished our canoe from the clay banks yep. and we're back in the Meaford Harbour. Tom, it was an exhilarating experience and I thank you very much for um, letting Rogers tap into your big canoe project. And just a quick, how can people get a hold of you if they want to sign up for this? Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Big Canoe Project. You can find us on Instagram, at Big Canoe Project. You can find us on our website, bigcanoeproject.org. Dot org. Yep. And tons of ways to get a hold of people. So put this on your bucket list. It was a great experience. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Krista. All the best. I'm Take glad care. the weather cooperated. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety visit StopTrackTragedies.ca. I'm Wendell Clark with a word about winning. We all know it takes a team effort in any sport and with any challenge. You can be a part of the winning team that shuts out impaired driving. Whether you're out on the town or just hanging out with friends, drink responsibly. Always have a plan for a safe ride home for yourself, your family, and your friends. You'll be helping to shut out impaired driving. Visit ArrivaLive.org to find out more. Arrive Alive. Drive sober.